It may be hard to believe, but there is actually one evil mastermind behind all of the major events of Jujutsu Kaisen. And I mean mastermind in the most literal way possible because the ultimate villain of the entire series is just a brain. At the end of the Shibuya incident arc, the imposter pretending to be Suguro Geto revealed his true identity, Kenjaku. Now this sorcerer has used his powers to implant his own brain into other host bodies, and it's not a normal brain either. It's got a freaky mouth, which makes it at least 10% more cursed than it already is. And over the course of 1,000 years, he's committed all kinds of very terrible atrocities, at one point being known as the most evil sorcerer in history. And honestly, if you ask me, he is still the most evil sorcerer in history as well. But not only is he the most evil one, he's also one of the most powerful figures in the entire world and history of Jujutsu Kaisen. And even at the point where we haven't seen the full extent of his true power, it is very clear that he has the powers at least of a special great sorcerer and probably then some. Really, only characters like Sukuna himself or Satoru Gojo really make him hesitate, but he'll gladly take on other fighters of any level without any fear. But what really makes this mysterious figure so willing to go head to head with the other most powerful characters in this show? And besides that, maybe one of the most well-written evil antagonists in all of anime. Well, for one, Kenjaku has a complete mastery over the basic building block of Jujutsu Kaisen's power system, which is cursed energy, being able to utilize massive quantities of it with absolute ease. And this is what allows him to be an excellent hand-to-hand -hand fighter by enhancing his physical attributes with cursed energy. After all, he has literally hundreds of years of experience using that exact power. But in addition to that, he's also mastered other really impressive applications of cursed energy, such as barrier techniques, and can even use a domain expansion without even setting up a barrier, a feat that we've only seen matched by Sukuna himself. Now, we're already getting into manga territory here, but in his fight against Yuki, he activates a domain expansion called Womb Profusion. But other than the disturbing name that it has, we don't really know yet what it specifically does other than pack a crazy punch. However, his true power, which makes him so unique, comes from the innate technique that only he has. Because Kenjaku's innate curse technique allows allows him to switch bodies, which means that he's assumed tons of different identities over the course of Jujutsu history. Sadly enough, only a few of these mysterious identities have been known, but it's assumed that he's secretly been many people over time. And I use the word secretly lightly because it's pretty obvious that someone is actually Kenjaku due to the massive surgical scar on their forehead. What's even more impressive though is that he doesn't just take over people's physical bodies. Kenjaku can also steal someone's memories and even their curse technique, giving him quite the collection of deadly abilities. Which now brings us to the main part of this video, because he has been working on this master plan of his for centuries, using each of his different identities to work towards his ultimate goal. So who has he been and why has he chosen to take over these specific bodies? So let's take a closer look at each and every one of Kenjaku's identities. And the earliest known identity is of course, well, Kenjaku himself. Self. Because obviously there has to be a first Kenjaku before he actually started inhabiting other people's bodies. Now, it is very much unclear whether certain feats were done as this original Kenjaku or later down the line under a different name. However, one thing that we do know is that even during the ancient era, the peak era of Jujutsu, he was already supremely powerful. One thing that we know is that he was once friends with the similarly old Tengen. And he's also the person who finally figured out how to turn a sorcerer into a cursed object object after their death, allowing Sukuna, for example, to be turned into the 20 fingers that Yuji would one day eat. Now, maybe the most renowned of Kenjaku's identities was that of Noritoshi Kamo, the so-called most evil sorcerer in history. This is, of course, not to be confused with his descendant here, Noritoshi Kamo, the Kyoto Jujutsu high school student. And as a Kamo, the OG Noritoshi was part of the big three Jujutsu families, though he's now considered a stain on that family tree. Now, his his claim to evil fame here was his creation of the Cursed Womb Death Paintings. These were Kenjaku's very first attempt at creating beings beyond humanity or cursed spirits. Here's what he did. He kidnapped and held a woman prisoner who was capable of giving birth to human spirit hybrids. And it was this wicked experiment with this ability that led to the creation of the Death Paintings. Though, I have gotta say, despite his messed up origins, Chozo here did turn out to be a pretty nice guy in the end. And so, it's through his 
Kamo ancestry that Chozo was actually able to use the family's special technique, which is blood manipulation. And it's actually possible that Kenjaku can also use this technique since he does gain the abilities to use of the innate techniques of the body that he inhabits as a brain, resulting in him collecting many powers throughout the centuries, most of which we've yet to see him use. But moving on for now, the next Kenjaku identity that we know of, jumping ahead several hundred years, is Kaori Itadori. That's right, Kenjaku is none other than Itadori Yuji's mom. Like, this isn't even a meme or a bit here. The main villain of the series is canonically the main character's mother. And due to Kenjaku's manipulative nature, it does seem like he probably had a hand in a... <clears throat> creating Yuji and probably has a hidden motive for doing so since he is the main character even though it often doesn't feel like that and therefore he's probably extra special in some way. And also due to this the death paintings technically actually are Yuji's siblings in a way or half siblings so when Chozo recognizes Yuji as his brother well he is not wrong. Now we don't actually know all that much about Kaori other than the reveal that she was possessed by Kenjaku and had the signature forehead scar we really haven't learned all that much about her. However, we do know her innate curse technique, but more on that a little bit later. Because for now, the last known vessel for Kenjaku, and his current one at least, is the one that we know the most about, the special great sorcerer Suguro Geto, former bestie of Gojo Satoru and known human hater. Now, after Geto's death at the hands of his bestie Gojo, his body became the current vessel for Kenjaku. And this is of course also what allowed him access to Geto's innate technique of Cursed Spirit Manipulation, an ability that would be instrumental in activating his master plans. And so shortly after assuming Suguru Geto's identity, Kenjaku actually allied himself with the so-called Disaster Curses. And if you need a quick refresher, this team consisted of Mahito, the Human Curse, Jogo, the Volcano Curse, Hanami, the Nature Curse, and Dagon, the Ocean Curse. And this group of special great curses has the goal of completely wiping out humanity so that curses can become the dominant species on Earth. And so basically what happens is that they meet with Kenjaku, who is at this point posing as Geto, who allies with them in order to help them get rid of Gojo Satoru using the Prison Realm here. Now, on the surface, they have a lot in common, actually. Both Geto and the Disaster Curses do hate humans, since Geto seems to see them as below sorcerer level. And Geto even goes as far as calling regular humans who can't manipulate cursed energy monkeys and believe that they are completely inferior beings. Plus, of course, he also has all the reasons to want revenge against Gojo for defeating him in the past. However, of course, in reality, Kenjaku actually has an ulterior motive. And now just to be clear, it is true that he actually does want to get Gojo out of the way, just like he's the biggest obstacle for the disaster curses, he is also the biggest obstacle and threat to Kenjaku. Because you know, Kenjaku has a plan that has been a thousand years in the making, and he can't just let Gojo go ruin it. But there's also another reason for him to ally with these curses, and it comes right down to how he's a master manipulator who's just using everyone around them for his own goals all along. Because instead of doing all the work himself, Kenjaku allows these disaster curses to use their immense strength and power to start enacting his plans for him. So yeah, really, if there's one thing we know throughout the story, everything that Kenjaku does is manipulative. I mean, what's more manipulative than literally taking over someone's body, I guess, right? And so Kenjaku delights in making people bend to his whims, all the while thinking that they're working in their own self-interest. And so really, no matter the situation, Kenjaku apparently is always in complete control and uses his tactical genius to stay several steps ahead of his enemies. And he even hides the true extent of most of his powers so that he can have the upper hand in combat as well. But now you might be asking, why is he doing any of this in the first place? What is Kenjaku's real end goal here that took a millennium to prepare? Well, to tell you about that, we're gonna have to dive deep into some manga spoilers, so while everything so far is covered in the Shibuya incident in season 2 of the anime, from here on out, we're looking at what we know about Kenjaku from the manga so far as well. Okay, so 
what is it? Well, Kenjaku's motive in the story is to test the literal limits of cursed energy and push beyond all conventions and boundaries of the powers within Jujutsu Kaisen. In fact, he believes that human beings who wield cursed energy and cursed spirits can't be the end-all be-all of Jujutsu. And so he does believe that something even greater than either of these entities must be possible. In fact, this is exactly why he tried making the cursed womb death paintings in the first place back when he assumed the identity of Noritoshi Kamo. But ultimately, Kenjaku determined that the death paintings were failing years because his <clears throat> children could not end up surpassing him. In the end, he came to believe that nothing that he personally could create would ever be able to surpass himself, so he made it his goal to use uncontrollable, unpredictable chaos to advance his goals instead. And so, enter the Culling Games. Basically, a lethal battle royale that pits Japan's strongest jutsu sorcerers throughout history against one another. Which is, I guess, what finally allowed Gige Akutami, the author of Jutsu Kaisen, to finally write his take on a manga classic, the tournament arc. Because you know, who doesn't love a good battle shonen staple? However, in a kind of nasty twist, this entire tournament is actually a ritual which draws out huge amounts of cursed energy at once. In fact, at least one of his other identities, but probably a lot more of them, which so far are still unknown, made binding vows with several really powerful sorcerers from the past so that they could one day compete in the culling games by coming back to life. And basically, by promising them a second chance at life through reincarnation, he convinced these sorcerers to be turned into cursed objects that could be resurrected later on. And these of course include truly powerful fighters like for example Hajime Kashimo, who can even pair on pair with the likes of Sukuna. And really, this shows just how long Kenjaku has been working on this master plan. In the present day, he was able to activate the spirits of these sorcerers to take over human vessels that he had prepared all along so that these warriors of the past could participate in his game. In fact, all of this happens in a very similar way to how Yuji ended up becoming a vessel for Sukuna. So yeah, basically with humans ingesting cursed objects that contain the sorcerer's cursed energy. Plus on top of that, some other regular people suddenly were awakened as sorcerers who hadn't formally had access to cursed energy before that. Now, how the entire ritual of the culling games actually works is a little bit complicated honestly, and we don't have ever every single detail quite yet. But basically, Kenjaku's ultimate plan here seems to be to use this concentration of cursed energy to fuse every non-sorcerer human being in Japan with Master Tengen. And in case you don't remember, Tengen is the ancient sorcerer who lives in the tombs under Jutsu High School, generating the barriers that protect the Jutsu High campuses. Now, Tengen's ability have already transcended humanity, making her immortal. In fact, she has been living for so long that she actually knew Kenja 1,000 years ago when both were still young. Apparently, they were even friends at one point, but clearly there has been quite a lot of division between them over the last past 1,000 years. And now, since Tengen's star vessel was actually killed during the hidden inventory arc, she wasn't actually able to merge with her. And as a result, Tengen is now evolving at a truly alarming rate. Usually, by merging with a star vessel, she's able to pause the alarming rate of that evolution, but now her appearance doesn't even appear human anymore. As a result, Kenjaku now plans on using the fact that Tengen has already become something beyond human to his advantage. In fact, as it turns out, the real reason that Kenjaku used the disaster curses is because he needed their power, specifically the power of Mahito here. By using Suguru's ultimate technique, Maximum Uzumaki, he is able to absorb the innate techniques of powerful cursed spirits. Because he needed Mahito's powers of idle transfiguration, because that's the key to to taking down the powerful barrier around Tengen, which is no easy feat honestly since Tengen is the most powerful barrier user in all of history. But of course, this is yet another proof that Kenjaku is a true master manipulator. He got four special grade curses who hated humanity to essentially complete his plan for him. Kenjaku truly is always using others for his own purposes. He used the disaster curses to help him seal Gojo and he promised the ancient sword sorcerers to be turned into cursed objects just so that he could use them later on as sacrifices in his culling games. And when he needed even more bloodshed to occur during the culling games to draw out even more cursed energy from panic and fear, 
he even manipulated the entire US government by convincing the president about Cursed Energy's potential military applications, causing tons of soldiers to be slaughtered as they entered the combat zones without any mastery of Cursed Energy. But let's get back to Tengen's master plan here though, because as we mentioned, by dissolving his protective barrier and completing the culling games, Kenjaku plans to force humanity to evolve into a state beyond its current existence by forcefully fusing all of Japan's non-sorcerers with Tengen. And unfortunately for Japan and the world, Kenjaku has already managed to dissolve the protective barrier. This was of course despite Tengen being guarded by the special great sorcerer Yuki, you know, the lady who makes a habit of asking much younger boys what type of girls they like. And for a minute there, it actually looked like Kenjaku was on the ropes. Because the combined efforts of Yuki and Chozo, who again is technically kind of Kenjaku's son I guess, gave him a real challenge there it seems. You see, Yuki's curse technique manipulates gravity, which seems like it would quite literally crush anything that Kenjaku could throw at her. However, he was actually able to conjure up the curse techniques of one of his previous bodies to counter Yuki's ability. And this was in fact the technique of none other than Yuji's mother, Kaori Itadori, whose curse technique is called the anti-gravity system, which truly was a huge stroke of luck because Kenjaku had to battle Yuki and her gravity-based powers. Truly, it is quite literally the perfect counter, so really who knows how many other secret techniques from his previous bodies Kenjaku has still lying around, ready to use at the perfect moment to catch his opponents off guard. And it is exactly having this huge assortment of techniques to choose from that is the one thing that helps Kenjaku stay one step ahead of everyone else as he enacts his plan. And to be honest, which is the reason why I think he's such a fascinating antagonist, even Kenjaku himself has apparently no idea what the result of his culling game ritual will actually be. He's just genuinely curious to see what will happen. To the point where he even believes that if the resulting being just takes the shape of a silly face, it'll just be comical to him even as he essentially dooms the rest of humanity as we know it. Because after all, as we know, Kenjaku definitely does have a sense of humor. As opposed to a lot of anime antagonists who are deadly serious and calm, cool and collected at all times, Kenjaku, let's be real, is pretty silly sometimes. And this is actually best displayed, I think, in his battle with Fumihiko Takaba. Now, Fumihiko is one of the ordinary people who suddenly found themselves with cursed powers at the start of the culling games. You see, Fumihiko Takaba is a comedian, all by a failed one. However, his curse technique is entirely based on his comedy style and involves turning his imagination into reality, which is an ability that will become ridiculously powerful should he ever be able to master it. And as he tries to take down the mastermind Kenjaku, it becomes just as much of a battle of wits as a battle of strength. However, much to Takaba's surprise, as they test each other to see who can make the other laugh, Kenjaku might actually be a lot funnier than the professional comedian. He's a true master of creating goofy faces and even knows a lot about various popular comedy TV programs in Japan. So much like Gojo it seems, he apparently had a lot of time to watch his share of movies in between creating his evil schemes I guess. And in general, Kenjaku has actually adapted surprisingly well to the modern era considering that he is 1000 years old. Really, you'd expect him to be kind of behind the times, but in addition to keeping up with television, he can also be seen playing the game of life with the disaster curses. But this is of course nothing compared to the time that Kenjaku who just pulls out a whole iPhone so he can read chapter 236 of Jujutsu Kaisen. Oh, okay, okay. So it's actually, I think it's implied that he actually just has some kind of surveillance operating so he can check out the Gojo versus Sukuna fight from afar. But since the literal manga panel of Gojo's death is superimposed over his phone screen, it definitely just looks like Kenjaku straight up downloaded the Shonen Jump app here. Either way, the man has definitely adapted to the 21st century and all of its technological marvels that come with it. Pretty impressive for someone who lived all the way back during the Heian era of Japan. And so really, that's just another way that this villain continues to shock the audience and defy all expectations. His over 1000 year old culling game plan is really for little other than just his own twisted amusement and sense of curiosity. For his own entertainment, Kenjaku is perfectly willing to sacrifice the entire population of Japan 
just so he can see what happens. He's at one time cold and calculating while also being fun loving in the most deranged and chaotic ways imaginable. And really, I think it's exactly this that allowed him to set his culling game plan in action and lead to the most intense Jutsu Kaisen arc yet, where we're going to find out even more about this evil mastermind and more importantly, have some more truly epic battles. And perhaps the biggest mystery still is what role Yuji actually has to play in all of this, because surely Yuji being able to act as a vessel for Sukuna and being literally birthed by the main villain of the story must have some major connections. But what part he plays in Kenjaku's plan is still a complete mystery. And on top of that, with all of Kenjaku's crazy powers, watching even a single fight of his can get really hard to wrap your mind around since he's busting out curse techniques left and right at this point. And between curse technique and reverse curse technique and innate technique, there are just so many techniques to understand. But thankfully, understanding all of these can be pretty easy. All you have to do is watch my entire video that explains the whole Jujutsu Kaisen power system in easy to understand words, I hope at least. So uh, make sure to check out that. Thanks so much for watching and I will see you in the next one.